today Michelle and I were going to share a, a talk form, like question and answer type of form that we would sit with after the, med after the uh, formal meditation like we're about to do. But she has COVID, so she's connecting, she's listening to us, but she's not feeling very well at all. She has the, uh, more of the acute symptoms of the COVID. So she's sheltering and healing, and I'm sure she would feel our metta and karuna for her for her healing. It's mostly in her upper respiratory and throat. So what I think we'll do today is um, ease into six, six in store awareness. Uh, for most of the silent time. And then maybe we'll practice a little guided Brahma Vihara after this sitting to see how the two go together, how they converge or integrate. Just checking in with posture the alignment of the grounding of the hips and legs and feet so that the spine can move like bamboo, easy and breathing along with the whole breathing body. anchoring on the touch sensation, either in a focal area, like the solar plexus or abdomen, or the in entire touch sensation, um, flashing, strobing, pulsing of the whole body, with body awareness, which means feeling the felt sense of the body from within the body, not filtered through a collection of, of a narrative of thoughts, memories, ideas about body. Just notice the mentality as it is, making those little commentaries, judgments, evaluations, analyzing, not exclude that at all from our sixth sense of awareness. But knowing what's grounding, like if you feel a connection of gravity, your body with the chair, ground, your back if it's leaning, your spine floating if it's straight, just that direct pre-cognitive awareness that knows the immediacy of touch sensation. Often as we feel the, the full body sensation spectrum, sometimes some of you like to abide in the sense of resting here in the solar plexus by the physical foundation of, of the knowing sense door, chitta, moment to moment knowing whatever is immediately appearing, light into the body, sound vibrations streaming into the body. All the senses entering and being received by the sensitivities 
of each sense door and feeling that those rare moments where there is just the pure receiving of touch, a lingering sound vibration or series of vibrations, and the other senses. The, the more we're aware in that restful abiding of the sensitivity, these sensitivities, these six sensitivities, and how raw and in a way vulnerable they are in receiving light, sound, sensation, fragrance, taste, and thought formations. And the recognition of the subtlety of abiding in those precognitive spaces, in those moments. So we, we notice what we've taught previously, we talk a vichara, we talk a being the precursor to mindfulness. It was, it's what helps create what Upandita called early mindfulness. So the vitaka is the connection with the focus of awareness, connection with the thought, the emotion, happiness, sadness, uh, grief, gratitude, pressure, vibration, heat, coolness, the immediacy of being right there for that input. Sometimes they can all be felt as we abide anchoring around the solar plexus because it's that is the knowing that becomes seen in visual experience. And the same knowing of hearing consciousness, the knowing of sound vibration so we can be anchored here and be aware of the subtle moments where there's contact of the incoming sense impression and the receptivity, the receptors. And then right in that moment, the Vitaka is touching that point with its presence, the sense of mindfulness forming for this sort of impossible to calculate timeless moment. And then its partner, Vichara, that sinks into or immerses into the object of awareness. And that would be the felt sense of it the feeling, sensing, and knowing of that touch sensation, that sound vibration, that light spectrum. And the, and the formations that become either a completely empty thought, thought formation arises, but it's as if it doesn't break the surface into consciousness. So we're just aware that the potency of thought formations, and then a thought formation becomes a mental state of calm, anxiety, joy, sadness, concentrated, uh, distracted. And then each case that, that's the knowing mind, the mentality of knowing these mental states. They're not I, they're not me, they're not mine. And, and so knowing in this form is continuously detaching from identification or self-referencing. So there's just 
what is that moment's mental state of sorrow, of feeling reverence, that moment of sound vibration or light, the sense of abiding in this kind of knowing, you'll see starts to cut off mental proliferation, where we're then forming ideas, and fabrications, we're embellishing that immediate experience into an, a narrative. So then we want to kind of unpack those formations that have become constructions, and concepts, and just come back to the bare knowing moment. That's what's happening. It's just knowing, just knowing. Knowing these thought formations, knowing that the knowing sense door is occurring, is happening right now. So you, you notice that when we're abiding this way in the moment, start to feel the protection of, this, of these qualities of connecting, sustaining awareness, and then a pure, fulfilling moment of complete mindful presence. And then it's impossible for the proliferating mind in that nano moment, the proliferating proliferating mind ceases. And if our subtle awareness picks up the subtlety of that cessation, we're actually knowing a moment of freedom from identification or self-referencing or attachment of any kind. Just the free flow, natural mind And then if there is a volition or intention to explore something that keeps arising or lingers, well, we have that intention. And we, we look in the, in the body for sensations that mirror whatever we're investigating, whatever, wherever our inquiry touches. In the thought realm, of mental states and emotions. Where in the body reflects or mirrors those arising moments of mental states. The calm, energetic, tiring, connected, disconnected, and try to, with a body-based awareness, not do anything more. This is doing nothing with full commitment. It means we're not going into the conceptual briars of making a narrative out of our experience. We're resting in that pre-verbal seclusion, solitude, the quiet of that, the stillness of that, the refuge of that.
having abided in in the awareness of the present moment experience because of the connecting or vitaka awareness and the sustaining or immersion awareness, vichara. Notice how we can have now the intention, the volition to call up Brahma, metta brahma vihara, metta or karuna, so either that beautiful selfless friendliness toward beings or special places. Places that when you think about them, the mind grows calm. Like a happy place, a refuge. So mentally it becomes an aspect of our monastic solitude, seclusion. And just the felt sense relationship of the memory or picture in the mind or creation in this temporal moment of a place of refuge, place where we feel protected, safe. And what's that relationship like? I have a kind of sprawling garden here, but I, I'm focusing on a certain area of it, meaning I tend to it several times a day and use compost and careful cultivation of the soil, the aeration, so it gets the nutrients from the soil and the air and the sunlight and the water. So I have this relationship with a, a number of young and fairly new transplants, birds of, par birds of paradise and citrus trees and also both a brand new red tea leaf and a very old tea plant. Not the tea that we drink, it's spelled T-I and there's green tea, red tea, um, the mottled hybrids colors and the tea plant is has been always sacred to native Hawaiian and Polynesian people it can be used in healing cooking and even planting it around the, your house or a room serves as a powerful protection, makes it a felt sense refuge, place of refuge. But my meta relationship, my kind of hyper friendliness has been towards seeing the new rooted teas beginning to to have new leaves, new young sprouts. And this powerful metta relationship with a very old, many, many decades old tea tree, a, a red tea. And many of the limbs of the bush, which is, you know, about head high.
you know, seem to have lost its sap. And there's no, it's kind of just like a skeleton in areas. But in this one area, there's a flush of new young leaves on this very old tea leaf plant with, with these shades of this purplish red and, and a forest green kind of next to it. And, and as I'm feeding it or watering it, connecting with the plant, I just feel this you know, extraordinary combination of reverence, respect, and this unconditional, selfless friendliness, love, respect. And then, of course, when we focus on a powerful touchstone, Brahma Vihara, as we as we turn to other experience, you know, when I move to other plants or come back in the house, I feel the residual reverberating effects of having you know, embraced the vulnerability of these new shoots. Will the new ones make it? Will they continue to take root? Will this grand parent old tea Will the new leaves keep coming from that one area where they're flushing? If it's a, if we turned our attention to the easy person where there's effortless ability to abide in, in, the, in kindness field of safety to un unravel the purest, most selfless, deep love. Now, often it can come when, when we embrace difficulty, the loss, grief, it can lead directly to, as we allow it to be and feel it, feel the grief, as just a quality of mind stream experience. Then nothing extra, not my grief. And as we kind of open to it, we feel that, that the energy of feeling that grief opens this profound, deep well of selfless love, unconditional love that then can just kind of stream in all directions at once. Or depending on our volition and mindset, we can just direct it to other beings or other special places. As I do with the, that, that part of the garden that I pay a lot of attention to, it feels completely different than all the other areas of the big garden here. So I feel there's always this relationship happening. Even as I walk out to go to a Pilates class, it's just I, I, I enter the domain of this lovely shelter, this garden refuge, where there's a lot of delight and joy that feels like, like a nurture and not like a self-made state that I'm, where there's attachment, clinging, or a narrative. Just the pure, raw, creativity of, of beauty 
and living, breathing human plant exchange. So having done Vipassana first, as we do the metta or karuna, or perhaps through doing some mudita, empathetic joy, or one of the great navigation, navigational tools to move through samsara, to move through our lives, the stability and deep wisdom of upeka equanimity that looks out over all the fields of loving kindness, the fields of care and compassion for the pain of the world, and that looks out over the field of fulfillment, beauty, and happiness. flushes out in young people, elder people, animals, and plant life. So we, we feel these fields as we're anchored in the wisdom of equanimity. And we feel the direct connection with Vipassana, observing stream of experience appear and disappear at the six sense doors. And what helps us sustain that inside awareness is the equanimity, the imperturbability of the non-reactive heart. It's not owning anything as I, me, or mine. It's the pure observing presence. And then just the intention to abide in unconditional friendliness, reverence, and gratitude or abide with the care and compassion on a cellular level of every every sensation and the network of feelings, electricity, and the flow, nurturing, vascular system. On that level, cellular level, we're calling up the metta to, to feel these systems that we relate to as ourselves, reflexively as oneself. What a delight, what a joy to feel that, the friendliness and the care for any area that's vulnerable or painful. And the joy of feeling all the ways that we're fulfilled and nurtured. Our worthiness in particular to abide in the knowing of our Worthiness is the deepest aspect of empathetic joy, where we connect with the deep well of worthiness. And sometimes we're directly connected to that through meeting difficulty. in relation to others in the world, in relationship to ourselves. And the, the pain of feeling unworthy. 
longing for connection, respect, fulfillment. So those lacks, by feeling them without judgment and identification, takes us right to the underlying stream of worthiness and goodness. So the grief that can take us to compassion and care. And the comparing mind feels unsatisfied. Always comparing as better, worse, the same. The weight of that difficult mind state, recognizing it, embracing it with awareness, and suddenly shining through is the gold of our goodness. We're worthy of feeling this kind of unfettered joy. And the profound transformation that happens when we feel care about pain and suffering and feel the beauty of that mind state of caring, the extraordinarily subtle pleasantness, the mind state of caring in the face of difficulty, uncertainty, vulnerability, In other words, we're, we can practice in this way rather than where we try to block everything out and grow metta, compassion, empathy, empathy, empathetic joy, equanimity, and then see what happens. Of course, that's another way to do it. But, but this particular meditation we're, we're anchoring in the actuality of experience happening right now and, and calling up the great tools of navigation, Brahma Viharas. the measureless nature of friendliness, respect, and kindness. The measureless quality, compassion, caring, the impossibility of, of measuring these boundless qualities. That fill all the spaces that we shine them on. The kindness, the care, and the appreciative joy the measureless nature of when we appreciate the absences of an assault on our systems and as we see their cessation of and abide in the relief and the joy and the appreciation that these rare, boundless, measureless qualities are right here. We have them, we're practicing them right now. And to appreciate that it is possible 
to appreciate their boundless nature, their purifying of our heart and bodies. And can we feel that rarest and wisest of the Brahma Vihara emotions. The emotion of imperturbability, the non-reactive and non-attached mental equipoise, the balance of mental states and emotions because of this queen or king of the Brahmaviharas, equanimity, upeka. She has the ability to look over in a measureless way all the fields of experience and not be pulled by what's alluring and attractive and pleasant and not be repelled by what's difficult, challenging, threatening, this standing in the middle of things as they are. When we meditate on Kamasaka, the flow of phenomena of nature as it is. Causes and conditions, why we experience every moment that's either pleasant or unpleasant, or neutral. Notice how the wisdom of this equanimity can just leave the feeling tone alone. Once we have the felt sense experience of this physical phenomena or this mental phenomena, the feeling the pleasant nature or the unpleasant nature or the neutral nature of it. And the wisdom of this Brahmavihara is that we just leave it at being a pleasant feeling tone, a natural response, not the reactivity, reactivity of wanting and attachment and craving. And leaving unpleasant just as it is, it teaches us about our own bodies and about the universe. The arising of unpleasant, the existence of unpleasant, the dissolution of unpleasant and abiding in the knowing of this dukkha, wait in an unpleasant feeling tone, it frees us from the reactivity of the, the state of reactivity, of aversion, ill will, anger, aggression. and the appreciative joy we might feel with that space that's created when we're not attached to the pleasant, when, when we're not reactive, suppressing or pushing away or judging the unpleasant and not confused and bewildered by neutral feeling tone, stream, Just take the last few moments.
is recognizing the presence of mindful awareness through connecting, sustaining, and then abiding in this moment to moment knowing the stream of change. And then the transmission of the influence of the Brahma Vihara emotions. The pure volition of just having their presence without an agenda to change or fix. What is it like to call up and abide? in the unconditional, measureless metta. And the care and appreciation for ourselves as as rare and precious human beings and appreciating it it's extremely rare and precious to come upon a practice like this to find that inner refuge and shelter the inner stillness Solitude, how healing, how nurturing, how unconditionally accepting of our moment to moment experience. We have, we have time for a couple of questions, if you have any, about the practice that we just did of Vipassana, and then the volition, the intention for the Brahma Viharas to flow forth from our heart. Sometimes when I've been doing the Brahma Vihara practices here at home, aware of, you know, aware of today's world, which is 
in the midst of such a of such areas of intense uh, uncertainty, changeability. You know, I'm feeling feeling grateful for having this inner we wake up, this inner place of rest and refuge. Solitude, where we, where the awareness is protective from the influx of hindrances, or as I mentioned, where we take an, an influx, say, of grief. This happened over the last couple of weeks in meditating and aware of, of the suffering in the world, the challenges in the world, and how by opening to that emotion, you know, feeling that grief, that fragility, that loss, you know, awakened this level of metta that was, it's been so profound and deep. Metta and the sisters of metta, you know. As I bring in formations, it might be through the filter of the lens of friendliness, or it might be through the lens of care and compassion for those places, inner and outer, of dukkha, where people are feeling helpless and overwhelmed, and not knowing what the next step might be. And then when I take a break from kind of following difficult world events, I go outside, I go into the garden. I feel held, I feel that receptive space of the healing from feeling what's there. Such as the portal to a deeper level of metta through, through embracing grief, allowing grief to flush through the system. Pretty amazing, pretty, I mean, I really felt all the Brahma Viharas, of course, through the portal of compassion, but then keeping it at a sense, sixth sense door awareness where there's a degree of the stream of wisdom, insight, you know, that keeps it pure, keeps it selfless, it keeps us from spinning into our own narrative, embellishing. So that's like, it's like a dance, it's like a symphony of the of Brahma Vihara emotions. Just at, in free flow, we can have the intention, we can also allow its free flow arising, or we can do the more structured psychological imagination technique and the phrases that we, we teach here. Uh, you know. So we choose what's most helpful. And today the emphasis has been acknowledge what's there. And then 
which Brahma Vihara can meet what is there. Appreciation or gratitude or compassion, care, friendliness. You have a question, Quinn? You have to unmute. Well, thank you, Steve. Good. Um, this talk is so appropriate and relevant. Sometimes I feel um, so much grief in, in the world and in my personal life as well that it feels like I'm at the bottom of despair. So um, I, I try to gather whatever energy there's left to bring right. on the Brahma Viharas. And at first it feels very mechanical. Yes. But then uh, somehow it, it seems to bring on like a, a flow right. of more uh, spontaneous Yes. Gratitude and uh, compassion. Right. And that allow me to, to be more accepting. Beautiful how that works. Okay. I, I remember, I remember the, the feeling of the mechanical aspect of first learning the practice as a, as a conceptual practice, you know, using concepts to eventually let them go or leap off the vehicle of concepts into the stream you know, of metta, when we have fed it, nurtured it, to, to, to be able to stream that way. So I, I, I learned just to be patient. The Upandita said, just keep doing it. If, if you lose the feeling, just stay with the, stay with the phrase or word or the, or the felt sense, image of that, of that person, or, or living, or animal, non-human or non-human, our sacred place. And, and that's how it was. It was, it felt like, it felt like, it felt wooden at first. You know, I didn't feel the, the so the moisture that's supposed to come from that deep, meditative concentration on the Brahma Viharas. But, but the encouragement was just keep doing it. Yeah. And, and, and suddenly, it's like the form falls away by itself. The image or the phrase, and then we find ourselves in the stream, in the metta stream, or just abiding in this knowing of kindness, loving kindness. So. Your experience reminds me so much of of my own experience. It's worth it. It's worth going through it. You know, it seems like an unclimbable mountain at first, and, and we're just looking up at it, and it's just this sheer, you know, limestone cliff. How do we get up it? Yeah, it's like being in the bottom of the pit and just yeah. gathering the effort and the energy right. to climb up again and again. Yep, that's yeah. right. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Beautifully articulated. Yeah. Oh, hi. Dan. Hi, Dan. Hi, Steve. <laughs> Good to see you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Um, so, uh, today, as I was sitting, um, uh, I seem to have a deeper glimpse of the arrival of aversion or pleasant nature or whatever, but um, over time, I've come to a point where what I feel is just dispassionate and this sense of dispassionate or not being involved and just letting it arrive 
has allowed me to go a little bit deeper and just not get entangled, but just watch it. But it's, uh, I'm kind of looking at it and thinking, this is not a pleasant feeling. It's just watching with a sense of distance from it. And um, I'm not suffering. It's kind of just, it breezes by and suddenly something pleasant comes and I can feel that. Um, but it's, uh, what it is is real, what I'm, that dispassionate sense yes. and it's been building for a while. And I don't want to interfere with it. I don't want to overlay it with meta or anything, you know, to move it into a different direction because it's almost like it, it's a tool that's so clear and allows things to come without getting involved with them as much. And so I don't, I'm kind of confused about applying an antidote or moving into the space when I'm not overwhelmed with what's going on. You know, I feel like it's it's a tool for skillfully getting over states that are I'm drowning in, as opposed to the, uh, having the clarity to watch things as they are, right, and, and let them be. And um, and it was almost like there was a few seconds of a just a stream of wow, this is I get to see deeper, deeper towards you know um, the start of the universe here. You know, right. I've got my own Good. James Webb telescope happening here that I can <laughs> see further back. But I mean, I don't know if I'm making it up or whatever, but it, it seemed like um, it was a different space than the Brahmi Vihara space. It is and, indeed. It's a, it's an insight space. Mm -hmm. This passion is a is a significant transformation uh, as as the insight process unravels unfolds you know so um, some of these insight spaces because of the inner nonsense non-sensual dhamma joy it, it's it's it feels very connected or mirroring of brahma viharas for you there's a there's a, there's a, you're looking through the lens of a vipassana equanimity, and and that's why this the strong and it's wise to leave it alone. Insights, emotion, critical, liberating emotion of dispassion, has arisen, and so, and your practice, your your wisdom practice seems to be leading you, seems to be predominant. So I got used to going to retreats with Upandita, doing at least 14 days of Brahma Vihara practice, and then, and then a transition into the Vipassana, or weaving the two practices together back and forth. And once I came, and I couldn't, I could, I couldn't drop in, the Brahma Viharas wouldn't be there. It was very similar to your experience. It just seemed, it just seemed like this, the channel, the frequency wouldn't arise. The frequency that I could attune to in the past of the Brahma Viharas on this kind of profound concentration level, it just wasn't there. And Upandita said that the that the insight impulse, the insight volition at that time was much stronger. Much stronger than the abiding in the Brahma Viharas, which became useful after that. It didn't stop. But when that comes up, when I recognize it, I set aside the Brahma Viharas and I, I stay with that that very significant emotion of dispassion. You know, I abide in it. I don't do anything to change it. I don't apply Brahma Viharas, you know, necessarily. At times, like you described, you don't need the Brahma Viharas. 
Good. Okay. It's I think describing it as a, a wavelength. You know, you get some radio stations, and that's right. Obviously, you only get the one. Um, that's right. And because uh, I feel like after years of practice, I have arrived where I, I see all my efforts to to change me and make my personality so perfect that I'll be happy forever. It's not <laughs> and so it's constantly referring me back to things that they are and right. just dealing with them. So now I, I kind of sandwich myself in this zone and it's a new mental state that I never experienced before. And it's actually just depressing, but it's also there's a reality to it that I can't not disengage from because it's it's something like and on the other level I feel like I've arrived. Yes. I'm seeing things clearly and yet having a certain amount of I could call it equanimity, but it's not a pleasant feeling. It's just I can watch it without yeah, getting equanimity involved. is not a pleasant feeling. It's okay. a neutral feeling tone. It's an emotion that doesn't move toward or away from anything doesn't grasp on to the object of of the pleasant feeling with attachment and it doesn't shy away from dismiss or reject or reject the object of unpleasant experience it's just there as you're saying you're, you're using the language of being in the present in an equanimous, non-reactive way. That's all, and that's it. That is yeah. it. But yeah, that's it. And, and so you're, you're also getting, you're not only feeling what how dispassion feels, you're learning more about how equanimity feels. When mm -hmm. it, it's, it's neither pleasant nor unpleasant. This it's neutral so feeling tone. Yeah. It's very mundane. It's like, yeah. it's Okay. Good work. Uh, thanks. This stuff really works. It's amazing. <laughs> well, it leads you to places you didn't expect. I mean, you have this anticipation and you read everybody about, you know, approaching bliss and uh, how things will be great and whatever. It's, it's the intended, it's the best place to go. But it's, the road is not, it doesn't, uh, the vernacular can't touch the actual course of how it, it no, evolves. No, right. It uh, happens. It happens when we're not looking. I, in my personal experience, insight moments are, are you know, d deeper. Dhamma opening yeah. moments yeah. occur. You know, when we yeah. just when we pick up. A pillow and replace it in another spot when we're hanging our clothes on the clothesline and just for a moment where we're not doing anything we're not looking for what we think we're looking for at other times that we have intentions to sit and practice or walk with mindfulness and so forth so it, it that's the beauty and mystery of it you know uh, as M Michelle likes to say about Suzuki Roshi, um, that readiness, that being ready for anything. So if we, we grow this comfort or dispassion in just abiding without needing to change anything or fix anything, some of it's pleasant, some of it's really unpleasant, some is neither. Yeah. Good. Thank you, Dan. Thank you.
another way that we can recognize that skillful state of dispassion. Um, and it's, its relationship and closeness to contentment. Uh, and I, I, I had a period of time where there's lots of mental strain and, and um, anguish. And I reported that to Sayadaw Upandita. And, and that's when he told me that, you know, side by side with this kind of busy mind, churning mind, you know, figuring out, analyzing, interpreting, embellishing, mind stream, side by side with that is, is another trajectory. The meditative mind, heart, the meditative development has its own separate trajectory. And, and the connection uh, with dispassion or, and or contentment is that the dispassion recognizes that, that streaming mind that wants to know, wants to figure out, that's looking for results, that's uh, interpreting everything, it's building all the, the whole edifice, you know, the whole show that we, that we created as humans, just out of mind states, and um, the fabrication that comes out of our mind states. So the healing and purification of meditation practice it's just is recognizing those two trajectories. The one that is continually wanting to find something out or get something or get rid of something. Um, um, and the dispassion towards it. It's just doing its thing. Sometimes, yeah, we're pulled in and we're part of the planning and remembering and creating and identifying. But when we have these moments, strong moments of disenchantment, sometimes it's a disenchantment with all the sights and sounds and sensations and so forth. And then from the disenchantment, we grow this wise balance, neutrality, toward all the this trajectory, with all the phenomena and wants and dislikes and likes and so forth. But from, from the meditative development mind, uh, we're developing these subtle, rare mind states like dispassion. That's just allowing the embellishing mind, the fabricating mind, the fiction of I or me or mine, just leaving it alone. As, as just what that is, it's what that is. And then coming back to rest in the felt sense reality of this moment. That's what our practice has always is. It's always been that way. And, and that, that's what we keep doing. We, just, we see that we're creating these, externalizing these inner edifices, you know, and then they're like, ghosts that haunt us or beckon to us to go in this direction or to go in that direction. And then when we learn that doing nothing with full commitment, you know, another aphorism from Sayadaw Upandita, we can see how it's related to the disenchantment and, and the dispassion and how clear things become and how, how good it feels to be connected with what's real, what's true. What's real and what's true? Our felt sense experience, pressure, vibration, heat, cold, tightness, mental anguish, mental happiness and soaring joy and the boundless nature of, of some of these skillful mind states and the appreciation and reverence you know, for having such a precious, practice and knowing how to find these inner places of rest, of relaxation. It's why we wake up, the word for 
relaxation and rest. At other places in the suttas, it's a synonym for liberation, nibbana. So we're practicing moment by moment. Every time we recognize the contentment of solitude, of seclusion, those aspects of rest and relaxation we know as we wake up. And, and then we're more in a place of readiness, non-expectation, you know, and that's when things, that's when we are looking away and something suddenly arises. We're doing something else. And that distraction is like, sometimes it's with the, the volition, volition of delusion, sometimes it's not with the volition of delusion, meaning wisdom is there. And that's what knows the difference between the neutrality of equanimity and the neutrality of delusion, where the mind is just kind of floating around, trying to avoid pain and, you know, trying. When we're not trying, when we're not looking, and we've also established ourselves in the trajectory of the wisdom practice. It's a curious and mysterious place to abide in this don't know mind and this readiness for anything to arise. Rose, hi. Hello. Um, you know, you're always um, mentioning the six sense doors, grounding ourselves in the um, in the felt sense. When it comes to like the mind door, right? Like you're always saying thoughts aren't real, but thinking is real, right? Yes. How do we ground ourselves in the thinking is real? Is it just like aware of like images, aware of you know, verbal sentences or languages. You know what I'm saying? What's the real, because it's in the body, I can feel it, the, the, the warmth, the tingle, all that stuff's really available. But how do you, what's the real part that I can read the texture of? Um, when, whenever, we're, whenever we're experiencing a felt sense moment that, that has the reality of, of textures, temperature, vibration, and so forth, it's primarily, it is true, it is primarily physical and dealing with the elements of the body and extension of the body in visual light, which is a substance, in, in vibration, which is auditory experience, and a felt sense. When we feel the vibrations of sound, that's hearing consciousness. And when we see light and, and shadow and form and contours, that's seeing consciousness and sensing consciousness for the other senses. And with the mind door, sometimes it's helpful to, to anchor at the sensation, at sensations, like a plate of sensations or points of sensation in the solar plexus, which is in the Asian psychology considered the heart-mind in this area. And, and then the emphasis is like maybe we're observing sights and then we're aware and observing seeing. And then, you know, suddenly that dichotomy falls away and we're just in, in the pure knowing that seeing is happening, knowing that hearing is happening, not involved with the, with the object of sight, the conceptuality of the sight and the conceptuality of the sound. It's just pure seeing, pure hearing, the other sensings, and then with the mind door, it's awareness turned on itself. We anchor for moments of awareness of awareness, knowing of the 
knowing stream of consciousness, the most subtle of all experience. Because so quickly does consciousness arise and pass, even quicker than pleasant, unpleasant, neutral feelings. Consciousness is, is so subtle and so swift. And, and so that's why it can be confusing and a little challenging to just abide. You know, sometimes the knowing at first is of the things that are being known, the other mental states and, and this, you know, the, the things, the objects of consciousness. But sometimes you just lean back on that subtlety, that subtle awareness that's just knowing and feeling knowing. So it, be, it has its own texture. It has its own f finesse and, and flow. So t t and it's different at different times. So just knowing that knowing is happening. It's the same, similar to knowing that thinking is happening. In the sixth sense, sixth sense door scale, um, what, we're, what we're knowing is all experience. The felt, ex the felt sense experience of what we're knowing is everything being experienced. But rather than going to the, the object of, of experience, we're just right here, kind of at the, at the pure consciousness, the pure knowing of experience. That makes sense? Yeah, I mean, it's going to take time. But so it's not just knowing that thinking is occurring or like formations of images and stuff. It's, it is the knowing of the knowing. And then like, say I knew I was like in a, in a state of like Brahma, deeper Brahma Vihara concentration. What yes. kind of knowing is that? Like knowing of a place, is that knowing of knowing or knowing of in a concentrated state or such? Yeah, in the Brahma Viharas, um, I mean, today was an exception because we, we, we blended some of the insight awareness. Uh, there, there, there is wisdom in the Brahma Viharas, and, and that's particularly when we clearly comprehend, along with mindfulness, the quality and characteristic and nature of a moment of metta or compassion, or joy, or equanimity. So, but it's not the knowing that I'm knowing that, it's just knowing. Well, at this, in this example, yeah. we're, try, we're knowing the emotion of the Brahma Viharas, right. the, the, the different tone and the different um, so that's the mind door too. Characteristics. Right? Yes. Mind that's mind also the mind door. Touch. So that okay. That's also the mind door that's looking at particular particular skillful states. So through the mind door of knowing, it's it's the wisdom of non attached present time awareness that's experiencing the measureless nature, a boundless nature of kindness or care our joy, our equanimity. Uh, and so anywhere along the way, we can be aware of knowing. See, if you have a moment of knowing, a sensing the characteristics, that would be a moment of knowing being in the mind door. It, we, if, if it's directed at a mind state, um, yeah, what are the characteristics of this oppositional state of fear or anger? Uh, you know, what is the characteristic of these various Brahma Viharas? And sometimes we're, we're not, we're not, we don't have any agenda at all. We're not exploring the Brahma Viharas. We're just abiding in the moment. And so it's mostly just the knowing of knowing. Characteristics, if we are exploring a difficult or a beautiful mind state, which we can choose to do. If we have the volition to explore. So we're, we're aware of the knowing and we're aware of the object that's being known. And then we, we can feel what are the contours and what are the characteristics and what, are the, what is the nature of that thing that we're aware of, Ex externally or internally, mentally or physically. 
can take work. <laughs> um, but so the knowing, um, the knowing of the knowing, that's the primary mind door. But then say I was like discerning skillful from unskillful, like mental quality, that would be using like wisdom and discernment, still the mind door, but that would still have characteristics. But I could be aware right. of the knowing that I'm knowing this and discerning characteristics. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Working on it. Yeah, you can be. So that investigative inquiry uh, is the second of the awakening factors after mindfulness. It's usually translated as investigation of phenomena, but it's really discernment. It's really a form of wisdom that recognizes what's skillful, what's unskillful, what hinders, what helps. That, that kind of mental presence and, and inquiry. It's, it's like that's what happens with the, after connecting with something, the immersion of awareness and feeling from within the object of awareness. Not externally, because then we're going to judge it and have an interpretation, and it's what we think about experience. We want to set aside or recognize when we're having overlaying experience with the whole mental narrative. So we want to sidestep that tendency so we have pure moments of just connecting with the things as they are, not as we think about them. I feel like I'm sensing And that all rests on discernment, yes. that discerning awareness. What's that? Yeah, I'm, I'm listening to what you're saying. It, like I, it's sort of internally clicking. Good. Um, just, it, it feels familiar. <laughs> so I think Good. I'm in the neighborhood. <laughs> you are, that, 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 that's it. When things feel familiar, you know, like if we had been doing a Brahma Vihara retreat, there are moments where it, We've never felt more intimate with the present. You know, it, it, it's so intense. And it, it, it's recognized as the feeling of being at home. You know, when, the, when our awareness is, as, as one Pali teacher taught, you know, the samadhi, the collected part, of awareness is, is he translated as perfectly put together. So if you think of different streams of water converging and becoming one stream. And so those different streams are energy and discernment and joy and calm, concentration, flowing into kind of one awakening mind state. And similar experiences with the Brahma Viharas. Each of them, we, we learn to trust the intelligence of metta, not what we think about it. The intelligence of it as it affects us and transforms aspects of ourselves. We accept more parts of ourselves that we are afraid of or dismissed or suppressed. Uh, as I was saying in the earlier part of the sitting today, how, how loss or grief can actually be the portal uh, with the acceptance and the felt sense holding of that grief it can be a portal to deep layers of love that we long thought we had lost or hidden. And, and that arising, that surging, is a profound sense of home. And the heart feeling contentment. The Buddha called it the sweetest happiness, you know, of contentment. That's when there's still that pleasant feeling tone, the inner Dhamma joys and happiness. But then when there's this enchantment and um, dispassion, and we're the awareness, the consciousness is resting in, abiding in the equanimity, the imperturbability, the unshakability 
of mind presence, of awareness presence, not going after what's leaning toward the pleasant, leaning away from the unpleasant. It's like the strength of bamboo is in its vulnerability of hollowness. It's empty inside. So with great winds, even hurricanes, it can bend this way, it bend that way. It's flexibility and it's emptiness or its, or its beauty and its strength and its wisdom. And that, that's how we often might use the, the Ram Vihara practice as a basis and stepping stones. They allow us to open to challenges, open to grief, open to you know, the, the pain and difficulties that are happening within, without. When we recognize that these have their own intelligence, we, we, we suspend our own um, tendency to interpret, you know, to fabricate. And so we just relax that part of, of the mind, that needing to know, needing to get, needing to change, that sort of endless trajectory of wanting and, and, and we feel and lean back on the safety, the refuge of the trajectory that's not looking for anything, that's learning to do nothing. And we feel the, in, the intelligence of all these skillful states and how they balance each other out when left alone, or sometimes just with the slightest reflection and the slightest shift or change in something, you know, a, how a little can be a lot. You know, the, the slightest change in, in, the, in this rudder of an airplane determines whether one lands in London or Lisbon. You know, so we, we experiment with just the subtlest little changes so we don't get into that fix it, change it mentality. We're awakening these little intelligence these areas of intelligence reflect. Feeling a little too tight or a little too attached to outcome. Feel that. In the feeling, there's the healing, that is the relaxing, the non-attachment, and so forth. And we come into a place of balance. There's nothing that we can't turn into wisdom. So my suggestion is to have the intention, you know, being aware, say you make a resolve to be aware of, of Vedana, Dukkha Vedana, Sukha Vedana, Upeka Vedana, unpleasant feeling, tone, experience, pleasant feeling, tone, experience, neutral feeling, tone, experience. That as a basis, and then also uh, mental volition that's behind everything, every moment, just side by side with the stream of feeling tones is this stream, mental stream. And, you know, to recognize them and receive or sense their intelligence, their inherent Dhamma intelligence. And then see what happens. You, you, you make little resolves to one day um, look at all your experience through the lens of one of the Ramaviharas and feeling tone. And then it's, it's, that's a, a shift from 
concentration practice, if the volition was to be with Brahma Vihara, we're side by side, connected and immersed in that Brahma Vihara, but we're also aware of the changing feeling tones that are happening. As we do a Brahma Vihara, what is it, where is it felt in the body and what's, it, what's its affect on other mental states? Metta is known to, to awaken and, and uh, um, pull together like a magnet all other skillful mind states. Uh, that's the connected aspect of metta. So to see if you notice that, that how it's a catalyst, uh, a skillful mental catalyst that brings together any number of other healthy, skillful mind states. To recognize that and recognize having the intention or the volition uh, to attune in that way. And then try another Brahma Vihara another day, you know, side by side with, with a weight enough feeling tone. And, and what's the difference? What's the difference when we're com resting completely immersed in a Brahma Vihara and when the wisdom mind is discerning the subtlety of experience, beginning with the Brahma Vihara. And then it, it changes, then it might be other things. So that's like immersing ourselves into the, the ocean of Brahma Vihara uh, as a collectedness practice, a samadhi practice, that complete immersion. And, it, and the other is then allowing the Dhamma awareness, the Dhamma intelligence, to arise out of that wellspring of unconditional compassion, kindness, joy, and so forth, and observing it change, observing it dissolving, the dissolution of that metta consciousness, mudita consciousness. It's another way of practicing. And, and we build a knowledge, we build the dispassion we were talking about earlier that is not affected, that's leading to more and more equanimity. It's not affected by whether something is pleasant or unpleasant or neutral. So see how that goes. And thank you for your practice. Much metta for all of you. Be happy, be careful, be joyful. <laughs>